Uh, thanks so much, Laura. I'm really uh, happy to be part of this conversation today. Just a little bit about my, my background. Uh, I work with the uh, Anti-Defamation League. Uh, I'm a senior research fellow at the uh, Center on Extremism there. And um, the Center on Extremism looks at um, extremism across the ideological spectrum. And our goal is to strategically monitor, expose, dis and disrupt extremism, terrorism, and hate. And I myself have been looking at right-wing extremism uh, for about 25 years. <clears throat> so I'm gonna uh, talk today, uh, that my topic is about the mainstreaming of extremism within the conservative movement. And I wanna talk about a little bit of an, give an overview of what we've seen in the last, uh, you know, about seven years or so. Um, and that is that um, one of the, you know, main things is the conservative movement's embrace of some white nationalist ideas. And by that, um, I mean, uh, for example, the embrace of something like the Great Replacement Theory, which we heard a lot about yesterday. You know, this idea that, um, you know, whites in this country are being replaced by non-white immigrants uh, through, you know, through and, and through other factors, social political factors um, that, you know, there, this is um, something that is actually being engineered by, uh, you know, liberal uh, socialist slash communist forces in this country. Um, we also, um, you know, see uh, in opposition to um, immigration, in general, even legal immigration to multiculturalism, to diversity. We're seeing an embrace of, um, from the conservative movement, our authoritarian leaders like Viktor Orban in Hungary, Eduardo Bolsonaro in Brazil, and, and, and Vladimir Putin in Russia. And along with all this, we're seeing a rejection of uh, democratic norms, such as accepting election results um, and the spread of election fraud uh, conspiracy theories and theories like the Great Reset, which I'll talk about a little bit later. So um, I think to you know to really understand um, how extremism has seeped into uh, the mainstream conservative movement, I want to talk about two strands within the conservative movement, and um, these these are uh, the two are paleoconservatism and Trump extremism, as we call it at the ADL. So. Um, Paleoconservatism uh, is really an obscure segment of the American right that seeks not only uh, limited government and tra um, traditional values, but also a return to older, less enlightened attitudes on subjects such as race, religion, ethnicity, and gender. And though some of the beliefs among paleoconservatives can be found as far back as the isolationists and America, for, uh, America firsters of the 1930s, paleoconservatism itself is, is, is newer. And it really arose in the 1980s in large part as a re reaction against neoconservatism, which paleoconservatives you know, just vigorously oppose. Because um, neoconservatism is a, a political ideology which, which um, emphasizes free market capitalism and an interventionist foreign policy. And paleoconservatives are, as I said, very much opposed to that. Um, and they're you know, opposed to intervention in foreign countries, to globalism in general, and also to uh, open borders and immigration and multiculturalism. So some, uh, just to give some well-known examples of uh, paleoconservatives, uh, Pat Buchanan, you know, who's a pundit and a columnist um, who has focused on, on culture war issues and also the impact of immigration and foreign intervention on the US. Uh, Buchanan is currently a frequent contributor to VDARE, which is an anti-immigrant and white nationalist site. Um, I also wanna mention Sam Francis because he's played a major role in, uh, I mean, he, he is now deceased to, to be very clear about that, but he, he was a columnist and an editor for the Washington Times until he was let go in 1995 for making racist comments. Um, and, but he, he really, um, you know, after he left the Washington Times, he really became a very important figure and thinker in the white nationalist movement. And he championed the Council of Conservative Citizens, uh, which was, um, which 
you know, um, it doesn't really exist anymore, but it's white supremacist group that emerged out of the white citizens councils of the 50s and 60s in the South. And, um, you know, Sam Francis is still revered uh, in the white nationalist movement. Uh, the last person I'm going to mention is Paul Gottfried, who's a former professor and a philosopher and a writer. And he's been credited um, with coining the term the alt-right, um, also known as the alternative right. I'll get into the alt-right a little later. Um, but he was a mentor and influencer on one of the main leaders of the alt-right, Richard Spencer. And what's clear is that these three figures and, and other paleoconservatives like uh, the person who runs Tacky Magazine and, and, and others as well, have formed some of the basis for the views we are seeing being mainstreamed in the conservative movement today. So Trump extremism is, is quite different from paleoconservatism. It's a decentralized but very enthusiastic faction made up of self-described patriots who continue to pledge their fidelity uh, to the former president and, and his false assertions that he actually won the election and that was stolen from him. And that, um, and you know, through um, among other things, massive voter fraud. And this new breed of extremists is foundationally animated by a uh, devotion to Trump, placing him over party or country. And they are um, really living inside um, an ecosphere of disinformation and conspiracy theories, as we just heard about conspiracy theories. Uh, fertilized by people like Alex Jones um, from Infowars, QAnon influencers, uh, the former president, and of course his enablers and many others. Um, and also just to distinguish, of course, between you know Trump extremism and paleoconservatism. Paleoconservatism is more intellectual and elitist, and Trump extremism is populist, right? And it's a cult of personality, and it's not about race. I mean, Trump welcomes people of all races as long as they embrace him. So I want to make that extinction. Um, so I want to talk now also um, about the alt-right. And um, this is a, a movement that really um, I focused on quite extensively when it sort of emerged in 2015. And um, it brings me to the Trump's 2016 election and um, to his uh, to his early days in office um, when he was enthusiastically supported by the alt-right, which, which we define um, at ADL as a loose movement that arose in the 2010s and by 2015 had become an important new segment of the white supremacist movement, bringing thousands of young, newly radicalized white men um, into the fold. And you know, the more, um, the more politically alt-right adherents uh, have typically sought to legitimize and expand racist and anti-Semitic views within the American right. So the goal of some of the followers of the alt-right and those that were interested in politics and the conservative movement, because not all of them were who were part of the alt-right, was to inject white nationalism into the conservative movement. So it's important, and we, we heard about this uh, from other speakers, um, it's really important to mention the Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville in 2017. Um, this was one of the biggest um, gatherings of white supremacists in the US in recent times. It included pretty much every segment of the white supremacist movement, including the alt-right, where you had people you know, dressed, uh, you had these young uh, men dressed in khakis and, and polo shirts, looking like, you know, um, and, and, and even aligning themselves in some ways with the conservative movement. You had uh, Klan members, you had neo-Nazis, um, militia members, you had all sorts of people included within that, that grouping. And um, this was, of course, the infamous gathering where, where these young men shouted, Jews will not replace us uh, at the University of Virginia. And then uh, the next day, the gathering erupted in violence when uh, white supremacists encountered counter protesters and a young woman was killed by a white supremacist who was using his car as a weapon and drove into the crowd, killed her and injured a number of people. Um, after the event, uh, then President Trump went on to say that there were fine people on both sides. And um, 
of course, this was a, a very disturbing uh, comment from him and many in the white supremacist movement um, took what Trump said as support for their cause. But of course, he had been making dog whistles to the white supremacist movement in many other ways as well. Um, and it's also important to talk about other extremism in Trump. So, you know, white supremacists uh, were not the only extremists that Trump embraced or that embraced Trump. So uh, during his time in office, Trump received the support of other far-right extremists, including the Proud Boys uh, and anti-government groups like the like militia groups and the Oath Keepers. And these groups were with Trump from day one and stuck with him as we clearly saw on January 6th during the insurrection. So um, I'm gonna move forward a little bit now um, in the interest of, of time also, but after Trump's loss in the 2020 presidential election, we saw the involvement of all of these groups that I just mentioned in election fraud conspiracies and the stop the steal rallies that followed the election. I'm gonna give uh, like an, an example from the white supremacist world Nick Fuentes um, is a white supremacist who was part of the alt-right. Um, he had been a student at Boston University and was leading a Republican group there and then uh, became more radicalized and, and um, open white supremacist. He's still interested in influencing the conservative movement. Um, I, I, will, I should say that he himself does not think he's a white supremacist. He calls himself a Christian conservative. So. Um, but he is indeed a white supremacist, racist, anti-Semitic, and holds white nationalist views. Um, and again, he was very much involved in the Stop the Steal rallies in, in December 2020. He formed a group of supporters called the Groypers, and he and his group are very active in transforming the conservative movement through pressure, through stunts, like disrupting, uh, you know, uh, they were disrupting events where conservative speakers uh, we're talking, and also by holding alternative events uh, to actually compete with the conservative movement. For example, um, Fuentes and the Groypers hold now an annual conference called the America First uh, Conservative Political Conference or, or America First PAC, um, and it competes with um, CPAC, which is uh, the Conservative Political Action Conference, and, um, but at, at this white supremacist event that Fuentes puts on, he has a number of elected officials who have spoken at the event. Um, and for example, that includes Paul Gosar and Marjorie Taylor Greene, both who are, you know, Congress people who are in the, currently in the government. Um, so, you know, this, this is, uh, because this normalizes, of course, this, this, this grouping, you know, that is able to bring together um, white supremacists and elected officials. In addition to this mingling of white supremacists and far right elected officials over the last few years, we've seen the emergence of COVID conspiracy theories, QAnon and the Great Reset. And the Great Reset is a conspiracy theory that gained traction during the coronavirus pandemic. And it warns that global elites are using the pandemic to advance their interests and push forward a globalist plot to destroy American sovereignty and prosperity. And adherents um, who sometimes promote anti-Semitism as part of the conspiracy theory, they also argue that the ultimate goal of this alleged plot is a global totalitarian regime. So all of these issues and groups I mentioned are factors Okay, in the conservative movement that make it, um, or, or, or factors that make the conservative movement more receptive to extremism. And let me spell out a little bit more of um, the, you know, these, these factors. So there's the anger at elites, uh, and that's in quotation, trying to destroy traditional American life. There's the embrace of conspiracies in every area of the social and, social and political spheres as well as demonization of, of the mainstream media and government institutions, including the FBI, which is you know, really something new within the, you know, the conservative movement. There's an increasing strategy of trying to exploit wedge issues such as critical race theory um, or uh, Black Lives Matter or the transgender community. There's a prevalent idea within the conservative movement that traditional norms and roles are being destroyed by 
liberals slash the left slash socialists uh, and also the Democrats being, you know, as they see as being part of this. And, um, you know, for example, you know, we, we know that uh, critical race theory is actually not taught in schools, but the prevalent um, uh, thought um, among conservatives is that it, it is being, you know, it is being used in schools to um, teach, um, first of all, that America is a racist country and to make white children feel guilty about being white. And this is something that you see, like if you look at the um, conservative press, this is written about, you know, on a, on a regular basis. Uh, also with regard to the transgender community, which is certainly also under attack these days, uh, we hear from the conservative movement about groomers, um, you know, trying to sexualize children and tell them that they can be uh, a boy or a girl and that they, you know, that, that you can be any gender and use the same bathroom or people have to, you know, are being forced to use pronouns to define themselves, things like that, animating and angering the conservative movement. There's also been um, a rejection of election uh, or democratic norms um, and um, election norms such as voting rights and, and women's rights. Um, and CPAC, which I mentioned earlier, which is the largest and most established uh, conservative organization within the US, which every, you know, which holds conferences many times a year, but really uh, in their uh, conference, their, their annual conference, which is usually held around February, basically every conservative leader, you know, is, is invited to uh, come to their, to their event. Um, and uh, that CPAC in um, this past summer uh, held one of their conferences in Hungary where they held up Viktor Orban, um, you know, the leader of Hungary as a, as a model, his, 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 his strategies as a model for the US. This is an authoritarian leader, but Viktor Orban, um, again, promotes traditional uh, values, uh, roles, um, within the population, promotes the family as, as the sacred unit within the country um, and has, uh, you know, essentially, um, you know, banned, I mean, effectively like a banned, like uh, the, you know, transgenders in the country. Um, and um, so, and then just, just to follow up on the Orban thing, uh, CPAC brought Orban to Texas um, a couple of months later as one of their main speakers. You also, um, when CPAC was in Hungary um, in, um, <clears throat> in, uh, in, in May, they, they, the, the young, they had young Republican leaders there and they met with ethno-nationalist groups in Hungary to sign a joint statement about preserving Western uh, you know, civilization, which is uh, really a euphemism in many ways for um, you know, for preserving white, um, like white, white culture. And that, I know that can be taken many different ways, but I'll, and then, but in any case, um, we can, we can talk about that. The other, um, the other thing, a uh, few other things I want to mention is the far right, not wanting to support, uh, Ukraine talking about America first. Uh, you had CPAC publishing a tweet, uh, like a week and a half ago, supporting Russia and Putin, but then deleting it because it was, uh, you know, saying it wasn't really an official tweet. And there's also this focus on America being, you know, this, this great uh, country before all these, these changes by progressive forces. So just, just a few conclusions um, to talk about that all of these factors um, that, that I just mentioned have caused many extremist candidates to be on the ballot. Um, and for the midterms, which are coming up in just a few, you know, few weeks. And almost all of them um, don't, basically all of them, I would say, don't believe that Biden is the legitimate president of this country. Uh, you had analysis from 538, uh, which does, um, uh, organization that does uh, statistical analysis, and they found that almost 200 public Republicans who were on the ballot in November uh, believe that President Biden's win was illegitimate and that 60% of Americans will have an election denier on, on the ballot this fall. 
So there is also a desire uh, to limit voting um, with many conservatives against any measure to make voting um, easier. So um, I will just end by saying that this is a precarious time um, in America when the mainstreaming of extremism is becoming commonplace. And um, in my 25 years of working on these issues, I'm uh, really more concerned than I've ever been. And I will stop there. <laughs>